In 1981, Nintendo released an arcade game named Donkey Kong that was developed by an up-and-coming game designer named Shigeru Miyamoto. It was Nintendo's first successful attempt at breaking into the North American video game market and helped establish both the company and the developer behind it in the video game industry. Players controlled a character known as Jumpman who must save a damsel in distress from the titular giant ape. A sequel to the arcade game followed a year later with Donkey Kong Jr., where players controlled Donkey Kong's son in his attempt to rescue the now-captured Donkey Kong from the game's antagonist, Jumpman, who was now known as Mario. A third Donkey Kong arcade game followed in 1983, which proved to be a rapid departure from previous titles. Donkey Kong 3 was not as successful as the previous two games, and Nintendo's focus shifted to producing games based on the first game's protagonist, Mario. What followed was a series of great titles from Nintendo starring the Italian plumber that led to the company's meteoric rise in the video game industry. Mario became the headliner in many of the top titles for all of Nintendo's platforms, and most of the games were produced by his original creator, Shigeru Miyamoto. However, Nintendo faced its first great challenge to Mario with Sega's own mascot, Sonic the Hedgehog. With his emphasis on speed and style, Sega Sonic proved to be an early threat to Nintendo's dominance. When Sega and Nintendo both released their 16-bit platforms, Sega was able to gain an early lead over Nintendo thanks to Sonic the Hedgehog making Super Mario World appear old and dated based on first impressions. With the rise of 32-bit consoles imminent, Nintendo looked to the Stamper Brothers and Rare to design a game that would save Nintendo from their rivals. Since the Stamper Brothers were still upstart developers when it came to the Super Nintendo, they invested the profits they made on the NES into cutting-edge silicon graphics workstations. This new computer technology that had only previously been used in high-budget Hollywood films allowed the Stamper Brothers and their team to render high-end computer graphics that made the visuals in their games have textures and appear three-dimensional. They would then take snapshots of these renders and compress the graphics into sprite layers that gave the illusion of 3D due to its original high-quality animation. Impressed by their new technological advances, Nintendo partnered with Rare to produce a new game starring Donkey Kong. The game was co-developed between Nintendo and Rare, and through its development, the Stamper Brothers formed partnerships with some of the game designers at Nintendo of America, such as Tony Harmon and Ken Lobb. This collaboration with Nintendo would result in Rare officially changing their name to Rareware. Their first video game under this name would be Donkey Kong Country, which was released in November 1994. Having previously spent many years translating games given to them by Nintendo, the Stamper Brothers were given time to analyze the Japanese approach to level and gameplay design and chose to create a 2D side-scrolling platform game in the same vein as Super Mario. Rare handled the majority of the heavy lifting for the game, heading up the roles of direction and design with many of their own employees. Reportedly, Shigeru Miyamoto had no input into the game's design, which led to his unfavorable view of the game. It would be the first Donkey Kong game that was neither produced nor directed by Miyamoto, positions that were instead taken up by Tim Stamper. Miyamoto and his team at Nintendo had previously released a Donkey Kong puzzle game for the Game Boy earlier that same year, which was loosely based on the early arcade games. For his Super Nintendo revival, Donkey Kong underwent a redesign which gave him heavy brows, a peaked lock of hair on top of his head, and a red necktie. The Donkey Kong players would control in the game would actually be the descendant of the original Donkey Kong, who is now known as Cranky Kong. Cranky Kong served as a wisecracking old ape who would give hints to finding the bonus levels in the game. Rare also created new Kong family members for the game that would help Donkey Kong on his journey. Funky Kong would allow Donkey Kong to travel between worlds to replay levels previously completed. Candy Kong served as Donkey Kong's love interest and would allow players to save their progress in the game. Donkey Kong would also have a partner in his adventures in the form of Diddy Kong, originally designed to be a reinterpretation of Donkey Kong Jr., who would serve as his faithful sidekick. The premise for the game would have Donkey Kong and his friend Diddy recover Donkey Kong's hoard of bananas which were stolen by an army of reptilian beings known as the Kremlings that are led by King K. Rule. The duo would travel across the land of Donkey Kong Island, an island in the shape of Donkey Kong's head, that featured various levels ranging from nature-based settings such as jungles and forests to man-made settings such as temples and mines. There were numerous methods to explore these levels such as riding in a minecart or launching through barrel cannons. Levels containing a boss fight would have the players face off against larger versions of regular enemies. Along the way, players could collect bananas, balloons, and golden letters that spelled out Kong to obtain extra lives. Players could gain access to various animal buddies found in crates throughout the island that offered different abilities. These included Rambi the Rhino, Espresso the Ostrich, Ongarth the Swordfish, Winky the Frog, and Squawks the Parrot. The gameplay system was structured so that one player could control either Donkey Kong or Diddy Kong and swap between them at any time. Donkey Kong was the stronger of the two, capable of taking out more of the enemies, while Diddy Kong was much faster and generally more agile. One hit would result in the player losing one of the characters, but they could be retrieved by finding DK barrels scattered throughout a level. This was enhanced somewhat with the game's addition of a two-player competitive and cooperative mode.
As part of their marketing campaign for Donkey Kong Country, Nintendo released a now infamous VHS tape titled Donkey Kong Country Exposed, which featured a brief tour of Nintendo of America's headquarters in Redmond, Washington, behind-the-scenes footage of Donkey Kong Country, tips and tricks that could be used in the game, and interviews with many people behind the game's development, including a brief interview with Tim Stamper, the director of the game at Rare. Tim! I was just curious as to how you made them look so real. Because we're based in Twycross, we have uh, a zoo about two miles away. Ah, uh, you went to the zoo. Went to the zoo, yeah, and had a, a good look at the gorillas and the monkeys and with video cameras. It was pretty funny. Using uh, advanced computers to uh, to produce a, a three-dimensional model that we can that we can display on a computer screen. Nintendo's marketing campaign behind the game was a success, and Donkey Kong Country became a smash hit. Incredible excitement began to grow around the game's visuals that displayed a level of detail not only seen as unsurpassed on the Super Nintendo, but far more impressive than anything seen on either Sega's consoles or their competitors at the time. This was thanks to the Super Nintendo's capability to display sprite layers within a 256 color parameter compared to the Sega Genesis which had a more limited engine that only had a 64 color palette. The game was a massive seller not only in North America but all over the world. Thanks to Donkey Kong Country, Nintendo was able to push the Super Nintendo past the Sega Genesis in console sales. The Stamper Brothers and their company Rare suddenly went from being viewed as the top developer in the UK to one of the top developers in the world. The video game industry spotlight was placed back on their company to an extent perhaps never seen by them before. Along with the game's amazing visuals and design, something that began to stand out about Donkey Kong Country for many fans was its incredible soundtrack. The game's music was the collaboration between in-house composers at Rare that consisted of David Wise, Robin Beanland, and Evelyn Fisher. For every unique environment in the game, there was a music track that featured a different musical style that presented the players with a distinct theme that was reflective of the mood and atmosphere for the entire level. For instance, the levels taking place during the day in the jungle would have a nice and upbeat tone to them, while the levels taking place underwater would have a very relaxing feel to them that was meant to place players in a more calming mood. Each of the other environments in the game could easily be described in a similar manner due to its accompanying music track. In a 1996 interview with David Wise, he explained that the sound and mood for each Donkey Kong Country soundtrack was largely shaped by his traveling experiences. Nintendo knew that the soundtrack produced for Donkey Kong Country was something special, so they released the game's soundtrack on a CD, something not often seen with video game music in North America at the time. With Donkey Kong Country, the Stamper Brothers had not only managed to save the Super Nintendo from possible years of decline, but revive a video game character that has largely remained absent and irrelevant from the video game world since the early 80s. As a result, Donkey Kong was now viewed as the unofficial mascot of Rareware in the same way as Mario was officially the face of Nintendo. In the year it was released, Donkey Kong Country received many accolades and awards from numerous publications, including several genre awards and Game of the Year awards. Donkey Kong Country was so popular at the time that it was included as part of the blockbuster video tournaments and received a special competition cartridge that included a time limit and score tracker for the game. This version of the game is now considered a very rare item to obtain due to its limited release and goes for high prices online. As successful as Donkey Kong Country was for Nintendo and Rare, the Stamper Brothers were faced with much criticism not only from within the video game industry, but in the gaming public as well. As amazing as the game's visuals and design were, many players felt that Donkey Kong Country's overall gameplay felt a little lacking. Many argued that Donkey Kong Country didn't really innovate when it came to pure gameplay mechanics, and as a result didn't feel that challenging. Though the Stamper Brothers studied games like Super Mario which influenced their design structure, for some it came off as merely an inferior imitation. This was not only felt by players, but fellow video game designers including Shigeru Miyamoto. Around the game's release, Shigeru Miyamoto and his team at Nintendo were busy working on the sequel to Super Mario World. When he first presented the game in its unique graphical style to Nintendo's internal evaluation committee, they had previously been impressed by Donkey Kong Country's pre-rendered graphics and ordered him to move the visuals more toward that direction. Since Miyamoto wasn't particularly fond of Donkey Kong Country, he rebelled against their order by changing the game's graphical style to become more similar to a cartoon. The end result was Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. His unfavorable view toward Donkey Kong Country was first made public when writer Stephen L. Kent had an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto and Tim Stamper. In front of Tim Stamper, Miyamoto told Stephen that Donkey Kong Country proves that players will put up with mediocre gameplay as long as the art is good. His negative remarks reportedly came off as very harsh toward Tim and his company. However, Miyamoto later apologized, explaining he was only being harsh due to the pressure he was currently facing with Nintendo developing Super Mario World 2. 
Miyamoto and his team would later use pre-rendered graphics similar to Donkey Kong Country in games like Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario RPG, and Yoshi's Story. The Stamper Brothers' public image would also take a hit in their home country during the promotional period for Donkey Kong Country. One of England's top video game-based TV shows at the time was Games Master, and one of its rival shows was called Bad Influence. While Donkey Kong Country was in production, both shows wanted to do a video profile of the Stamper Brothers company. Instead of having to deal with two TV crews coming and visiting their company, they tried coming up with a plan where the production team from only one of the TV shows, Bad Influence, would come to film their studio while later providing selective clips of what they filmed to the rival show, Games Master. Unfortunately, this plan backfired when the producers from Games Master learned that they lost to a rival show and took offense. Later, Dominic Diamond, a Scottish comedian and current host of the show Games Master, vocalized his frustration with the Stamper Brothers turning away their show for their rivals and reportedly described the Stamper Brothers as physically unattractive in front of a viewing audience of over 3 million people. While it was never officially confirmed by the brothers given their media-shy nature, this event left a sour note with the Stamper Brothers and their company when it came to appearing in the public media, and it marked the last time the Stamper Brothers would ever attempt to have a public appearance in the media. Despite the criticism they received from within the video game industry, Donkey Kong Country was still an undeniable success for Rare and Nintendo, so the Stamper Brothers pushed on developing more games in the franchise. Their first follow-up was Donkey Kong Land for the Game Boy, which was released in June of 1995. The game was structured very similarly to the Donkey Kong Country formula, featuring similar areas but with new original levels. However, due to the Game Boy's limitations, there were fewer levels than in Donkey Kong Country, and only one character was displayed on the screen at a time. Character swapping would just have the other character teleport and replace the previous character on screen. The game's soundtrack would be composed by David Wise, who was accompanied by Graham Norgit. For their next follow-up on the Super Nintendo, Tim Stamper knew that they wouldn't be able to get away with just thriving on the hype formed around the first Donkey Kong Country. He knew that players wouldn't fall in love with the game's visuals so easily this time, so he pushed his team to design a game that was not only visually better, but also much more challenging than its predecessor. The sequel would come to be known as Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest and it was released in November 1995. Diddy's Conquest starts with Donkey Kong being kidnapped by the Kremlings who are now led by Captain K. Rule, who demands the banana whore that was sought in the previous game for Donkey Kong's ransom. This leads Diddy Kong to embark on a new adventure with his girlfriend Dixie Kong to take down the Kremlings once again and rescue Donkey Kong. The first thing players noticed was the game's shift in its overall theme. While the first game featured environments primarily based around the tropical jungle of DK Island, the second game starts where the first game ended and then moves to Crocodile Isle, the home and origin of the Kremlings. Here the Kremlings featured a more pirate-themed style when it came to their designs and apparel. Despite these new appearances, the levels and environments of Crocodile Isle were just as varied if not more so than the first ones featured on DK Island. Players had a partner system similar to the one seen in Donkey Kong Country, except now they would play as either Diddy Kong or Dixie Kong. Diddy Kong was still considered the faster and more agile character, but Dixie Kong had the ability to glide in the air over long distances using her hair. Either character could also use the other to throw at enemies or to get to otherwise hard-to-reach areas. Cranky Kong and Funky Kong returned, providing similar features in Donkey Kong Country, and they were joined by Wrinkly Kong, Cranky Kong's wife, and Swanky Kong, who provided the options to save the game, receive game tips and secrets, and earn extra lives. There were many returning animal buddies including Rambi, On Guard, and Squawks, and they each had new abilities added to them. They were joined by newcomers Rattly the Snake, Squitter the Spider, Clapper the Seal, and Glimmer the Fish, who each had their own unique abilities. There were also new kinds of barrel cannons with different characteristics that gave way to more traversal challenges. But the main new additions in Donkey Kong Country 2 were the new collectibles in the game. Along with the types previously seen in Donkey Kong Country, players now received banana coins that could be used as currency with the other Kongs, DK coins found in every level that could be traded with Cranky Kong, and Krem coins that were awarded to the player every time they completed one of the new objective-based bonus levels. Players could normally progress through the game to face Captain K. Rule and rescue Donkey Kong, but the more skilled players who hunted down every last Krem coin could gain access to the secret Lost World, which contained some of the hardest levels in the game and the true final confrontation with Captain K. Rule.
Once again, like its predecessor, Donkey Kong Country 2 received many positive reviews from critics and was well received commercially. While it wasn't viewed as a worldwide phenomenon as was the first game, Diddy's Conquest proved that Rare could push beyond the standards they set with Donkey Kong Country as well as improve upon many of the criticisms had with it. The game featured many environments that were much richer in detail and technologically impressive for the console. Everything from the game's visuals to the stage and level design was seen as an improvement over the original. David Wise returned to compose the game's soundtrack that is not only considered the best soundtrack in the franchise, but one of the best video game soundtracks ever made. According to a 1996 interview, he composed the game's music during his experimental Paris phase, resulting in a very eclectic soundtrack. As with the first game, the soundtrack was also released on CD. Diddy and Dixie Kong returned in Rareware's next follow-up, Donkey Kong Land 2, for the Game Boy in September 1996. While it had more in common with Donkey Kong Country 2 than the first Donkey Kong Land had with Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Land 2 featured similar areas but with different level designs to compensate for the Game Boy's graphical limitations. For this game, the music was remixed by Grant Kirkhope instead of the original composer David Wise. In 1996, Nintendo released their successor to the Super Nintendo with the Nintendo 64. Once again, Miyamoto and his team launched a brand new Mario game with Super Mario 64, and it established many of the foundations for three-dimensional platform games. Meanwhile, Tim Stamper and his team remained on the Super Nintendo to release one final installment of Donkey Kong Country. It would become their most ambitious game for the Super Nintendo and the most unique departure for the Donkey Kong Country franchise. The third game would be titled Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, and it was released in November 1996. Dixie Kong's Double Trouble starts when Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong embark on a vacation following their previous victories against K. Rule. However, they soon go missing, and it's up to Dixie Kong and her cousin Kitty Kong to search for them. Once again, there was a shift in the game's location to the Northern Cremisphere, which was filled with vast mountain lands possibly influenced by the mountainsides of Northern Canada and large surrounding bodies of water. While originally home to the Brothers Bears and the Banana Birds, the area has been invaded by the Kremlings, who are now being led by a new leader named Chaos, who is secretly being controlled by Baron K. Rulenstein. Their invasion has resulted in the land becoming polluted by their industrial factories, which leads to many of the animal wildlife evolving into semi-mechanical forms and the Kremlings to appear mutated or genetically enhanced. Dixie Kong controlled the same as she did in Donkey Kong Country 2, while Kitty Kong was more similar to Donkey Kong when it came to his strength, except Kitty Kong had his own unique characteristics such as the ability to bounce off water or break fragile surfaces. Wrinkly Kong once again granted players the option to save their game, Swanky Kong returned with a new carnival minigame where Cranky Kong served as your opponent, and Funky Kong developed different vehicles that could be used to explore the northern cremosphere. Unlike in past games, the world map provided more navigation opportunities which allowed players to discover multiple paths in secret areas. Players were introduced to the Brothers Bears, a family of bears that would help Dixie and Kitty Kong throughout their adventure in exchange for various items. On Guard, Squitter, and Squawks returned from Donkey Kong Country 2, and they were joined by Ellie the Elephant, Perry the Bird, and Nibla the Fish. Once again, more barrel types returned, providing new challenges, and there were new types of collectibles. DK coins returned, but now they had to be collected by defeating a special Kremlin found in every level. Bear coins were the game's new currency that was used in exchange for items or information in the game. Bonus coins returned and gave players access to the secret world of Krematoa. Donkey Kong Country 3 received numerous positive reviews at its release. Rareware impressed many fans with the way they pushed the technical limits of the Super Nintendo once again while creating the most challenging game in the trilogy. However, the fanfare surrounding the release of Dixie Kong's Double Trouble was more muted compared to prior installments. Donkey Kong Country 2 had done such an amazing job at surpassing the expectations set by the first game that the third game felt like a smaller step in improving on that formula by comparison. Also, many of the changes made in Donkey Kong Country 3 came off as unfavorable for many players. Fans felt many of the familiar character designs that were dramatically transformed in the third game were not as good as their originals. The duo of Dixie and Katie Kong were considered not as compelling of a team of as the ones in past games. The soundtrack for Donkey Kong Country 3 had David Wise return to contribute a few music tracks, but the majority of the game's music was produced by Evelyn Fisher. While it had its share of memorable tunes, the overall soundtrack also felt underwhelming compared to prior offerings. The game also received much less press and promotion compared to the past two games because it was released shortly after the launch of the Nintendo 64 when Super Mario 64 was Nintendo's big holiday title. Rareware wrapped up their Donkey Kong Land trilogy the following year when they released Donkey Kong Land 3 for the Game Boy in October 1997. The game served as a combination between a remake as well as a follow-up to Donkey Kong Country 3. 
The premise for the game had Dixie and Katie Kong on the search for the Lost World while the Kremlings did the same. The game featured similar environments and enemies found in Donkey Kong Country 3, but the worlds and stages had their own unique layouts. In January 2000, an updated Game Boy Color version was released, but due to compatibility problems, the game was only released in Japan where it sold nearly 300,000 copies. After the Donkey Kong Country trilogy was finished for Super Nintendo, the Stamper Brothers took a break from the franchise to work on more original titles for Nintendo. Over the years, Rare would return to the trilogy and work on their re-releases. Donkey Kong Country was ported to the Game Boy Color in 2000 and the Game Boy Advance in 2003. Each release contained new features such as additional minigames, a time trial mode, and more multiplayer options. However, due to the limitations on the Game Boy platform, some of the music had to be either removed or replaced with new music. Donkey Kong Country 2 received similar treatment when it was ported to the Game Boy Advance in 2004. But when Donkey Kong Country 3 was ported to the Game Boy Advance in 2005, it received much more notable changes. There was a new world in the form of Pacifica, which had its own unique levels and a new boss. Swanky, Funky, Cranky, and Wrinkly Kong each had their own new set of minigames for the players to enjoy. But perhaps the most noticeable change to fans was the game's all-new soundtrack composed by David Wise. This change was most likely done to accommodate the Game Boy Advance's inability to produce the same music as the Super Nintendo without dramatically reducing its quality. Each of the new tracks presented a very different musical style from its Super Nintendo counterpart that resulted in a different mood and theme for many of the levels. While many fans have criticized David Wise's score for not holding up to the original by Evelyn Fisher, it's still debatable among fans which soundtrack is truly superior. The Donkey Kong Country series was regarded as some of the best games released in its time. Each of the games would eventually become available to download on the Nintendo Virtual Console for new players to experience and old players to relive once again. There are many who still believe that the Donkey Kong Country franchise remains overrated due to all the hype created around the first game's release. In fact, many publications that once praised the games with awards during its release now regard them as some of the most overrated games of all time and vastly inferior to the Super Mario games created by Shigeru Miyamoto and Nintendo. While the Stamper Brothers Donkey Kong Country series will probably never surpass Miyamoto in the Super Mario games, many fans believe it could be argued that no other developer or franchise could come as close to comparison in terms of quality as the Stamper Brothers games have. After many years following their releases, this trilogy of games is still considered some of the best games ever produced by Rare. Each of the Donkey Kong Country games rank in the top 10 best-selling titles for the Super Nintendo. 
While Donkey Kong Country remains the third overall best-selling game on the Super Nintendo behind Shigeru Miyamoto Super Mario World and Super Mario All-Stars, it's still regarded as the best-selling game on the Super Nintendo that was not originally bundled with the platform. Not only were the Stamper Brothers Donkey Kong games many of the top-selling games on Nintendo's platforms, but they were one of the few outside developers to ever dramatically change the look of a Nintendo character. The redesigned Donkey Kong and his accompanying cast of characters would continue to exist in future games developed by Nintendo. In 2010, nearly 14 years since the last original Donkey Kong Country game, Nintendo announced a direct sequel to the Donkey Kong Country trilogy in the form of Donkey Kong Country Returns. While it would be developed by the Austin-based Retro Studios, it served as a successor as well as a tribute to Rareware's classic trilogy of games. Many people who've turned their backs on the Donkey Kong Country franchise tend to forget that the appeal of the games didn't merely come from the visuals that felt ahead of its time. The games were beloved by their fans for the world created by Rareware that sucked players into the game. The game's world and characters had a sense of self-referential charm that was considered second to none. The Stamper Brothers and their company Rareware showed the world that their game designers not only had the means to create through advanced technology, but they had the talent for creating lovable characters and believable worlds that players wanted to come back to. Even though the developers at Rareware would go on to create more original titles under Nintendo, they were still considered responsible for developing future games featuring Donkey Kong and his family they had created. The Kong family would return once again in brand new titles developed by Rare, but on Nintendo's new 64-bit platform, the Nintendo 64. Let's see what's in here. Hey guys, can I play? Next time, in part 3 of this Rare Retrospective, Rare creates a brand new franchise with Nintendo to compete in the growing fighting game genre. While it would be one of their most short-lived franchises, its signature style would create a legion of devoted fans that would continue to play the game long after its release. 